so in this module uh, we will look at uh, supervised learning right uh, if you remember in uh, supervised learning uh, we talk about experience right uh, where uh, you have uh, some kind of a description of the data so in this case let us assume that uh, i have a customer database and i am describing that uh, by two attributes here age and income so uh, i have each customer that comes to my uh, shop i know the age of the customer and the income level of the customers right and my goal is uh, to predict whether the customer will buy a computer or not buy a computer right so i have this kind of labeled data that is given to me for building a classifier right remember we talked about classification where the output is uh, a, a discrete value in this case it's yes or no uh, yes is the person will buy a computer no the person will not buy a computer and the way i describe the input is through a set of attributes in this case we are looking at age and income as the attributes that describe the describe the customer right and uh, so now the goal is to come up with a function right come up with a mapping that will take the age and income as the input and it will give you an output that says the person will buy the computer or not buy the computer so there are many different ways in which you can create this function and uh, given that we are actually looking at a geometric interpretation of the data i am looking at data as points in space uh, the one of the most natural ways of thinking about defining this function is by drawing lines or curves on the input space right so here is one possible example so uh, here i have drawn a line and everything to the left of the line right uh, would uh, th th so these are points that are uh, red right so everything to the left of the line would be classified as um, uh, would be classified as would not buy a computer and everything to the right of the line where the predominantly the data points are blue will be classified as will buy a computer so how would the how would the function look like it will look like something like if the income of a person remember that the uh, the x axis is income and the y axis is age so in this case it basically says that if the income of the person is less than some value right uh, right less than some x then the person will not buy a computer if the income is greater than x the person will buy a computer so that's that's a kind of a simple uh, function that we will define just notice that we have completely ignored one of the variables here which is age so we're just going by income if the income is less than some x then the person will not buy a computer if the income is greater than x the person will buy a computer so is this a good rule more or less right i mean we get most of the points correct right except a few right so it looks like uh, yeah we can we can survive with this rule right so this is not too bad right uh, but then you can do slightly better ha uh -huh. right so now we got those two red points that uh, those pesky red points which were on the wrong side of the line earlier now seem to be on the right side right so everything to the left of this line will not buy a computer everything to the right will buy a computer right? everyone who is to the right will buy a computer so if you think about it what has happened here so we have improved our performance measure right so at the cost of something so what is the cost here so earlier we are only paying attention to the income right but now we have to pay attention to the age as well right so the older you are right so the income threshold at which you will buy a computer is higher right so the younger you are the younger means lower on the y axis so the younger you are the income threshold at which you will buy a computer is lower right so that is that clear so the so the older you are right so the income threshold is shifted to the right here right so the older you are so you need to have a higher income before you buy a computer and the younger you are your income threshold is lower so you don't mind buying a computer even if your income is slightly lesser right so now we have to start paying attention to the age right but then the advantage is you get much better performance right can you do better than this yes aha uh -huh. okay now almost everything is correct except that one pesky red point but everything else is correct and so what has happened here we get much better performance but at the cost of having a more complex classifier right so earlier if you thought about it in geometric terms 
So, first you had a line that was parallel to the y axis therefore, I just needed to define an intercept on the x axis right. So, if x is less than some value then it was one class if it is greater than some value it was another class. So, in the second function it was actually a slanting line like that. So, I needed to define both the intercept and a slope right and now here it is now a quadratic. So, I have to define three parameters right. So, I have to define something like a x square plus b x plus c. So, I have to define the a b c the three parameters in order to define the quadratic and I am getting better performance. So, can we do better than this? Ah, okay. So, somehow does not seem right correct seems to be too complex a function just to be getting this uh, one point there right and I am not sure I am not even sure how many parameters you need for drawing that because Microsoft use some kind of uh, spline uh, PowerPoint use some kind of spline interpolation to draw this curve I am pretty sure uh, that it has got lot more parameters than it is uh, worth. And another thing to note here is that that particular red point that you see is actually surrounded by a sea of blue right. So, it is quite likely that there was some glitch there either the person actually bought a computer and we have we have not recorded it as having bought a computer or there was some extraneous reason the person comes into the shop sure that he is going to buy a computer, but then gets a phone call saying that there is some emergency please come out immediately and therefore, he left without buying a computer right. There could be variety of reasons for why that noise occurred and uh, this will probably be the more appropriate classifier right. So, these are the kinds of issues that we will have to think about what is the complexity of the classifier that I would like to have right and uh, versus the uh, the accuracy of the classifier. So, how good is the classifier in, in, uh, in actually uh, recovering the right input output map and are there noise data in, 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 in the uh, in the input in the experience that I am getting is, is it clean or is there noise in it and uh, if so how do I handle that noise right. So, these are the kinds of issues that you will have to look at right. So, uh, so these kinds of um, lines that we drew right um, kind of hiding one assumption uh, that uh, that we are making. Uh, so, the thing is the data that comes to me comes as discrete points in the space right and from these discrete points in the space I need to generalize and be able to say something about the entire state space right. So, I do not care where the data point is on the x and y axis right and I, I should be able to give a label to that right. If I do not have some kind of assumption about these lines right and if I do not have some kind of assumptions about these lines. The only thing I can do is if the same customer comes again right or somebody who has exact same age and income as that customer comes again I can tell you whether the person is going to buy a computer or not buy a computer, but I will not be able to tell you about anything else outside of the experience right. So, the assumption we made is everything to the left of a line is going to do one thing or the other right. So, everything to the left of the line will not buy the computer everything to the right or everyone to the right will buy a computer this is an assumption I made. So, the assumption was the lines are able to segregate people who buy from people who do not buy or lines or the curves are able to segre uh, segregate people who will buy from who will not buy. So, that is a kind of an assumption I made about the the distribution of the input uh, data and the class labels. So, this kind of assumptions that we make about these lines are known as inductive biases. In general inductive bias has uh, like two different categories one is called language bias uh, which is essentially uh, the type of lines that I am going to draw. Am I going to draw straight lines or am I going to draw curves and what, what order polynomials am I going to look at and so on and so forth these form my language bias. And search bias is the other form of inductive bias that tells me how in what order am I going to examine all these possible lines right. So, that gives me the uh, uh, gives me a search bias right. So, putting these to the, these things together we are able to generalize from a few training points to the entire space of inputs right. So, I will make this more uh, formal as uh, we go on in the in the, in the next uh, next set of modules right. And so, here is uh, one way of looking at the uh, whole process. So, I am going to be giving you a, a set of data which we will call the training set. So, the training set will be will consist of uh, 
uh, say as an input which we will call as x and an output which we call as y. Right? So, I am going to have a set of inputs, I have x1, x2, x3, x4, likewise I will have y1, y2, y3, y4 and uh, this data is fed into a training. This data is fed into a training algorithm, right? And uh, so the data is going to look like this in our case, right? So remember, our x's are the input variables, right? This is x's are the inputs. So in this case, I should have the income and the age. So x1 is like 30,025, and x2 is like 80,045, and so on and so forth. And the y's are the labels; they, they correspond to the colors in the previous picture, right? So y1 does not buy a computer, y2 buys a computer and so on and so forth. So this essentially gives me the color coding. So y1 is essentially red and y2 is blue, right? And I really, if I'm going to use something numeric, right? This is what we will be doing later on. I, I really cannot be using uh, uh, these values. First of all, y's are not numeric and the x's vary too much, right? So the first coordinate in the x is like 30,000 and 80,000 and so on and so forth and the second coordinate is like 25 and 45. So, that is that's a lot, uh, uh, lot smaller in magnitude. So, this will lead to some kind of uh, numerical instabilities. So, what we will typically end up doing is uh, normalizing these so that they form a pro appropriate, uh, approximately in the same range. So, you can see that I have tried to normalize these uh, x, x values between 0 and 1, right? So, I have chosen an income level of uh, say, uh, 2 lakhs is the maximum and age of 100 and you can see the uh, normalized values and likewise for buys and not buys, I have taken not buys as minus 1 and buys a computer as plus 1. These are arbitrary choices now, uh, but later on you will see that uh, there are specific reasons for wanting to choose this encoding uh, in this way, right. And then the training algorithm uh, chugs over this data, right, and it will produce a classifier. So now this classifier, I do not know. I do not know whether it is good or bad, right? So we had a straight line in the first case, right? The, an axis parallel line. If we did not know the good or bad, and we need, needed to have some mechanism by which we evaluate this, right? So how do we do the evaluation? Typically, is that you have a, what is called a test set or a validation set, right? So this is another set of x and y pairs like we had in the training set. So again, in the test set, we know what the labels are. Okay, it's just that we are not showing it to the training algorithm, we know what the labels are because we need to use the correct labels to evaluate whether your training algorithm is doing good or bad, right. So, so this process by which this evaluation happens is called validation, right. At the end of the validation, if you are happy with the quality of the classifier, we can keep it. If you are not happy, then go back to the training algorithm and say, hey, I am not happy with what you produced give me something different, right? So, we have to either iterate over the algorithm again, we go over the data again, try to refine the parameter estimation or we could even think of changing some uh, parameter values and then trying to uh, redo the uh, uh, training algorithm all over again. But this is the general process and we will see that many of the different algorithms that we look, uh, uh, look at uh, in the course of, uh, during the course of these lectures uh, actually uh, follow this kind of a process, okay? So, what happens inside that green box, so inside the training uh, algorithm is that there will be this learning agent, right, which will take an input, right, it will produce an output y hat, which it thinks is the correct output, right, but it will compare it against the actual target y that was given for the, uh, in the training, right. So, in the training you actually have a target y, so it will compare it against the target y, right, and then figure out what the error is and use the error to change the agent right, so that it can produce the right output next time around, right. This is essentially an iterative process. So, you see the input, okay, produce an output y hat, okay, and then you take the target y, you can compare it to the y hat, figure out what is the error and use the error to change the agent again, right. And this is by and large the way uh, most of the uh, learning alg algorithms will operate, uh, most of the classification algorithms or even regression algorithms will operate and we will see uh, how um, each of this works as we go on, right. Uh, there are many, many applications, I mean this is too numerous to list, here are a few examples. Uh, you could look at uh, say fraud detection, right. So, you have some data where uh, uh, the input is a set of transactions made by uh, a user and then uh, you can uh, um, flag each uh, transaction as a valid transaction or not. Uh, you could look at sentiment analysis, you know, uh, 
uh, uh, variedly called opinion mining or bus analysis, etc., where I give you a piece of text or a review written about a uh, product or a movie, and then you tell me whether the movies, uh, whether the review is positive or whether it's negative, and what are the negative points that people are mentioning about, and so on and so forth. And this is again a classification task, uh, or you could. Uh, use it for doing churn prediction where uh, you are going to say whether a customer who is in the system is likely to leave your system or is going to continue using your product or using your service for a longer period of time. So, this is essentially churn. So, when a person leaves your service, you, know, you call the person a churner and you can label whether the person is a churner or not. And I have been giving you examples uh, from medical diagnosis all through. Uh, apart from actually diagnosing whether a person has a disease or not, you could also use it for risk analysis in a slightly um, indirect way. Um, I will talk about that uh, uh, when we uh, when we do the uh, algorithm for classification. So, we talked about uh, how uh, we are interested in learning uh, uh, different lines or uh, curves that can separate uh, different classes in supervised learning. And uh, so, these uh, curves can be represented using uh, different structures. And throughout the course, we will be looking at uh, different kinds of learning mechanisms uh, like artificial neural networks, support vector machines, uh, decision trees, nearest neighbors, and Bayesian networks. And uh, these are some of the popular ones, and we look at these in more detail uh, as the course progresses. So, another uh, supervised uh, learning problem is the one of uh, prediction or regression. Uh, where uh, you, the output that you are going to predict uh, is no longer a discrete value. It is not like uh, will buy a computer, does not buy a computer, it is more of a continuous uh, value. So, here is an example where uh, at different times of day, you have recorded the temperature. So, the input to the system is going to be the time of day and the output from the system is going to be the temperature that was measured at a particular point at the time. right? So, you are going to get uh, your experience or your training data is going to take this form. So, the blue points would be your inputs and the red points would be the outputs that you are expected to predict. So, note here that uh, the outputs are continuous or real value. right? And uh, so, you could think of this in this toy example as the uh, points to the left being day and the points to the right being night. right? And uh, just as in the previous uh, case of classification, so, we could try to do the simplest possible fit in this case, which would be to draw a straight line that is as close as possible to these points. So, you do see that uh, like in the classification case, when we uh, choose a simple uh, solution, uh, there are certain points at which we are making large errors. right? So, we could try to fix that and try to do something more fancy. But you could see that uh, while uh, the daytime temperatures are more or less fine with the night times, uh, we seem to be doing something uh, really off, right? Because we are going off uh, too much to the uh, the right hand side, right? Or you could do something more complex, uh, just like in the uh, classification case where we wanted to get that one point, right? So we could try and fit all the temperatures that were given to us uh, by looking at a, a sufficiently complex curve. And again, uh, this, as we discussed earlier, is probably not the right answer. And you are probably in this case uh, surprisingly you are better off fitting the, the straight line. right? And uh, so, these kinds of solutions uh, where uh, we are trying to fit the noise in the data, we are trying to make the solution predict the noise in the training data correctly uh, are known as uh, overfitting, overfit solutions. And uh, one of the things that we look to uh, avoid uh, in, um, in machine learning is to overfit to the training data. So, we will talk about this again uh, in, in uh, new course. right? And so, what we do is uh, typically we would like to do what is called linear regression. Some of you might have come across this under uh, uh, different circumstances. And uh, the typical aim in linear regression is to say take the errors that your line is making. So, if you uh, take an example point, uh, let us say take an oops. Let us say you take an example point somewhere here, right. So, this is the actual training data that is given to you, and uh, this is the prediction that your line is making at this point. So, this quantity is essentially the, the prediction error that this line is making, and uh, so what you do is you try to find that line that has the least uh, 
prediction error right. So, you take the square of the errors that uh, your prediction is making and then you try to minimize the, the sum of the squares of the errors. So, why do we take the squares? Because the errors could be both positive and negative and we want to make sure that you are minimizing that regardless of the sign of the error ok. And uh, so, uh, with sufficient data right, so linear regression is simple enough you could just solve it using matrix inversions as we will see later. Uh, but with uh, many dimensions right, the challenge is to avoid overfitting like we talked about uh, earlier and then there are many ways of avoiding this and uh, so I will uh, again talk about this in detail uh, when we look at uh, linear regression right. So, one point that I want to make is that linear regression is not as simple as it sounds right. Uh, so, here is an example. So, I have two input variables x1 and x2 right and if I try to fit a straight line with x1 and x2 I will probably end up with something like a, a1 x1 plus a2 x2 right and that looks like a, like a plane in two dimensions right. But then if I just take these two dimensions and then transform them transform the input. So, instead of saying just x1 and x2 if I say my input is going to look like x1 squared x2 squared x1 x2 and then the x1 and x2 as it was in the beginning. So, instead of looking at a two dimensional input if I am going to look at a five dimensional input right. So, that will and uh, now I am going to fit a line or a linear plane in this five dimensional input. So, that will be like a1 x1 squared plus a2 x2 squared plus a3 x1 x2 plus a4 x1 plus a5 x2. Now, that is no longer the equation of a line in two dimensions right. So, that is the equation of a second order polynomial in two dimensions right. But I could still think of this as doing linear regression because I am only fitting a function that is going to be linear in the input variables right. So, by cho uh, choosing an appropriate transformation of the inputs I can fit any higher order function. So, I could solve very complex problems using linear regression and so it is not really a weak method as you would think at first first glance right. Again we will look at this in a slightly more detail uh, in the later lectures right. And uh, regression or prediction can be applied in a variety of places. Uh, one popular place is in time series prediction you could think about predicting rainfall in a certain region or how much you are going to spend on uh, your telephone calls. Uh, you could think of uh, doing even classification using this if you think of you remember our encoding of plus 1 and minus 1 uh, for the class labels. So, you could think of plus 1 and minus 1 as the outputs right and then you can fit a, a regression line regression curve to that and if the output is greater than 0 you would say it is class is plus 1 if the output is less than 0 you would say the class is minus 1. So, you could use the uh, regression ideas to fit uh, do to solve the classification problem. And uh, you could also uh, do uh, data reduction. So, I really do not want to um, you know give you all the millions of data points that I have in my data set, uh, but what I would do is essentially fit a curve to that and then give you just the coefficients of the curve right. And uh, more often than not uh, that is sufficient uh, for us to get a sense of the data and uh, that brings us to the next application I have listed there which is trend analysis. Uh, so, I am not uh, really interested in quite uh, many, many times I am not interested in the actual values of the data, but more in the, uh, the trends. So, for example, I have a, 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 a solution uh, that I am trying to measure the running times of and I am not really interested in the actual running time because 37 seconds to 38 seconds is not going to tell me much, but I would really like to know if the running time scales linearly or exponentially with the size of the input. Right. So, those kinds of analysis again can be done using regression and uh, the last one here is again uh, risk factor analysis like we had in classification and you can look at uh, which are the factors that contribute most to the output ok. So, that brings us to the end of this module on uh, supervised learning.